Hello and welcome to the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies live stream. This is our first live stream event, so please bear with us if we have any issues along the way. We'll be holding these events periodically and we have some very exciting presentations uh, in store. Today's presentation will be hosted by SEU co-founder and board member Robert Powell. He's going to be reviewing recent testing he completed on a 99.88% pure magnesium sample first obtained in the Ubatuba region of Brazil in 1957. Powell will review the history of the sample, uh, previous chemical testing, isotopic analysis of the magnesium, as well as isotopic analysis of impurities in the sample that were 100 ppm levels. He'll explain more about that, uh, namely strontium, barium, zinc, and copper. Lastly, we'll discuss the meaning of the results that he obtained. Those of you who are watching live can submit questions in the chat room that you'll see here on your right, and we will get your questions about midway through, so that'll be at about 30 minutes. Um, so until then, I'll hand it over to Robert. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this SCU YouTube conference. Um, I want to tell you a little, little about who I am before I start. Um, my degree's in chemistry. I worked in the semiconductor field. Uh, I was an engineering manager. Uh, I also managed a chemistry lab. And then about 13 years ago, I retired early and I've spent a large amount of time analyzing the subject of UAPs, or as you may call it, the UFO phenomenon. Uh, we also created the SCU, uh, myself, Morgan Beale, Richard Hoffman, about three years ago, and that stands for the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. And just to give you a little feel for what that organization's like, its goal is to scientifically analyze uh, the UAP subject. And we have over 80 individuals, uh, over 25% of those have PhDs. Most have degrees in the hard sciences, whether it's physics, biochemistry, mathematics, statistics, software, what have you. Um, so it's, I'm telling you this so you have a feel that there are a lot of individuals with scientific backgrounds who find the UAP subject worthy of analysis. Now, I want to, before I start, just give uh, recognition to three other people on the paper, uh, which I'll, I'm about to talk to you. Uh, one is Dr. Michael Swords. Uh, Mike actually came down to Austin, where I live, and helped me with the determination of how we would do the analysis. Uh, also, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Mark Rodiger, who's the head of KUFOTS, and a special thanks to Phyllis Budiger, a fellow chemist, who was very helpful in getting a second lab so that once we got our first analysis, we could get, try to duplicate it at a second laboratory. <clears throat> so let me tell you a little bit about the history of this, and then we'll kind of go into the uh, chemical part. First thing I just want to mention is that I love giving live presentations, so I can't I can see the people I can't see you guys, but chemistry I know most people hate, and if I was live I could see your faces and go oh, oh no I'm, I'm Robert Robert you're talking too much too chemical uh, you know get out of that but I can't do that so I will do my best to keep this at a high level. And if anyone has some very specific questions, feel free to ask them at the end of this presentation and any, anything's fine. I'll be glad to answer it. So this case begins in 1957 in Ubatuba, Brazil, which is near the Atlantic Ocean. And there's a gentleman who's out fishing and he looks up in the sky and he sees a disc shaped object moving up at high velocity. And then suddenly the object explodes and millions of pieces of it are thrown all over the ocean. And he's not far from shore. There are pieces on the shore. So he goes back and he collects three pieces of this disc shaped object that supposedly exploded. Um, this was in 1957. He takes those three pieces along with the note and he sends it to a Brazilian newspaper. 
This gentleman remained anonymous throughout this time period. The only thing we know is based on his writing, he was well-educated, but we know nothing else about him. The Brazilian newspaper, I just want to give you a quick feeling of what happens with the samples now. The Brazilian newspaper gives it to a Dr. Fontes in Brazil. Dr. Fontes gives it to an organization in the United States called the APRO, and that happens in 1958, about a year later. APRO then does some work on the sample and then finally gives it to Dr. Peter Sturick at Stanford University. And that's where our testing comes in because Dr. Peter Sturick knows Dr. Michael Swords very well. He gave Mike some samples. And then Mike and I were talking one day and I said, hey, I could do some isotope analysis on the trace elements, not just the magnesium. And so that's what kicked all of this off. All right, so now I want you to see this is a sample from 1957 from Ubatuba, Brazil. And I apologize for any light diffraction, but we have a, a better picture that we'll show you on the screen now, that, uh, which I took with just a low magnification microscope. So you can see that object. Now, while you're looking at that object for a moment, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing. We're looking at the isotopes of this material because as I just told you, the history, right, is pretty checkered. We don't know exactly who had it when. Uh, we do know, absolutely, that it didn't show up uh, after 1957. It existed then, and it has been tested more than any, quote, UFO fragment that has ever been tested. At least a dozen laboratories have tested pieces. What I'm showing you is a very small piece. It's about 0 0.05 grams. Uh, a lot of it's been lost over the years, but this is from the, the original sample and it came from Dr. Peter Sturry. All right, now that you've seen that, um, we can drop that off the screen. Um, I want to talk a little bit about not the isotopes yet, but what is that sample made out of? Okay, the initial test by Dr. Fontes in 1957 said the sample was 100% magnesium. Well, that, that's basically true because his equipment at that period of time could not detect any trace elements. So all he could say was as far as he could determine, it was 100% magnesium. Now, once the sample was shipped to the United States, it was tested by Oak Ridge National Laboratories. Now you might ask, why would Oak Ridge National Laboratory, Laboratories care about a UFO sample? Well, it was because no one knew how a piece of pure magnesium could show up in Ubatu, Brazil in 1957, thus the interest of Oak Ridge National Laboratories. So they tested it using uh, a spectrograph and they came up with basically 99 0.9% pure magnesium is what they're showed. Um, they also found impurities of aluminum, iron, and silicon. And this was in 1958. So now we move to 61. It goes to Dow Chemical, which was one of the top chemistry laboratories in the United States at that period of time. They detected 99.9% .9 pure magnesium. And additionally, strontium, barium, zinc, and copper, which are the same impurities we detect today. So <clears throat> in terms of, you know, the bottom line, what's in this material, it is basically magnesium so pure that in the year 1957, the only places that could have made that magnesium that pure would have been Dow Chemical or some major university laboratories. 99, to give you a feel, 99.88% pure magnesium is comparable to your highest commercial grades today that you can get in a commercial lab. Uh, now we can make it more pure than that today, but remember this was found in 57. Okay, so um, what's the other thing that's of interest here? The strontium. No one had added strontium to magnesium at trace levels other than Dow Chemical. And they had only done that 
in a laboratory setting. So we're still left with the question of how does magnesium of that purity show up in Ubatuba, Brazil in 1957? All right, so now we move to the next part of the testing, isotope analysis. Okay, the, the key thing to realize here is that with isotope analysis, you can determine whether something's terrestrial, you can even determine where on the earth it came from. For example, if there was a dirty bomb and it had uranium in it, a chemist with modern equipment could tell you if it came from the Ural Mountains in Russia, or if it came from, a, or if it was uranium from Southwestern United States, or if it was uranium from the Congo in Africa. That is how accurate high resolution ICPMS testing is. Now, the first time this, pro, this Ubatuba sample was tested in that way was in 1968. And it was tested by the, uh, what was called the Condon Committee. If you recall, uh, some of you may not be familiar with it, so let me back up a little bit. The Condon Committee was initiated by the University of Colorado in 1968 on request of the United States Air Force. The US Air Force wanted to get out of the business of tests of basically tracking UFOs and reporting on them. It had caused them a lot of headaches with Congress. Um, so they were wanting to get out. So here we have the Conduct Committee and they're going to test this Ubatuba sample. Dr. Roy uh, Craig with a PhD in chemistry did the analysis. Now here's the interesting part. Uh, Dr. Michael Swartz and I went to Texas A&M and we got the papers of Dr. Roy Craig and we looked at this work that he had done. That was among his papers. He indicates there that the magnesium 26 is at, and, and that's an isotope of magnesium. We have three isotopes, magnesium 24, 25, 26. Well, magnesium 26 is 14%. Okay, so let's stop for a moment. The norm for magnesium 26 is 10.99% uh, up to 11.03. So that's not normal. Yet in the Condon report, uh, Dr. Roy Craig states, and so I'll just quote so that I get his statement right. The Brazil sample did not differ significantly in magnesium 26 isotope content from other magnesium state samples. Now, there's two things there that are really outlandish. One, that he would state that 14% is similar to 10.98, 10.99%. The second thing though is he left out the 14% number in his report. So I, I'm mentioning this only because it kind of irritates me that that would be done. And that, that should not be done. But nonetheless, let's continue through and leave my you know, concern with this and continue with the isotope analysis. So Dr. Peter Sturick had the uh, sample tested in the 1990s because then ICPMS became a major tool in chemical analysis. So he had it tested at a lab in Vancouver and Charles Evans, another lab that has places throughout the United States. In the case of the uh, lab in Vancouver, they had slight differences in the magnesium ratio. Charles Evans' lab, it looked fairly good. And we have, I, we can show it on the screen. It's uh, image number two. And you'll see on there, uh, basically the ratios of uh, using magnesium 24 is, is your base number because that's your basic uh, element. And so they it looks at the ratio of magnesium 25 to 24 versus magnesium 24 to magnesium 26. Now, in the upper left corner, you see all these no, Dow samples and, and you see SUA, which is the Ubatuba sample. 45 minutes. And if you look on the graph, you see the A, B, C, D, E. You see a circle in the center. That's where the nominal is. And basically they all fall on the same line. So this is indicating that the magnesium isotopes are terrestrial in nature. Now, does that, can we conclude definitely that's the case? No, because the Vancouver lab did not get that. And 
the uh, Condon report did not get that information either. That, theirs was up around 14. So we're basically, we don't know right now. So the next step was to do isotope analysis of this of the samples that Dr. Michael Swords had. And we were going to do one additional thing, right? Today, we could do a lot more than just look at isotopes of magnesium. We could look at the isotopes of the trace metals. That's not something they could do back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. So that was the plan. We identified a chemical lab in Austin, it's the one that I used to manage. They are accredited, uh, ISO accredited. Uh, there's uh, basically, uh, they do testing. I'm trying to remember who all they test for General Motors, for NASA, for Intel. So uh, their work is considered good work. So Dr. Michael Swords flew down. We met with uh, Dr. Tim Hussein who manages that lab. And we sat down and discussed how will we test the sample, okay? Now, let's back up for a moment. Remember how that sample was handled. Because of the way it was handled, we really can't do surface analysis because it's been in people's hands. So there's gonna be sodium, potassium, calcium, all that. Um, so what we decided to do was to etch the surface, to put it in acid, remove much of the surface of it, all of the surface of it, not much. And then we would analyze a small piece of the sample because that's all we need. We didn't have to destroy the entire sample. But the key thing was, in addition to looking at magnesium isotopes, we were going to look at the isotope ratios of strontium, barium, copper, and zinc. So that was the plan. And in 19, excuse me, in 2017, we got back the first results from uh, the lab in Austin, which is called um, Cerium Lab. They used to be part of advanced micro devices, but they got sold and all sorts of stuff that happens in the semiconductor industry. And so now there's Cerium. So if uh, we look at image number three, we'll flip that up on the screen. So what you see, you see three columns. On your left are the three basic ways that magnesium shows up in terrestrial samples, magnesium 24 being the common uh, source of magnesium and the two isotopes being magnesium 25, 26. The center tells you the nominal abundance. And for magnesium, I can tell you, you could put error bars around that of basically plus or minus 0 0.04. So it doesn't vary much off of that. To the right is the Ubatuba unknown. So the Austin lab got 79.31. Now that might not seem much to some people, but that is a significant diversion off of what normal magnesium is. The same thing for magnesium 25 and magnesium 26. So we were kind of excited. Oh, wow, got some magnesium. It looks like it's, it's not meeting terrestrial. So then uh, the next thing we did is we looked at the isotopes, same thing. We got some variations. I won't go into those right now, but we got variations there. So what's the next step? Okay, we need a second lab to verify the first lab, right? Because you can't, you can't depend on just data from one lab. You've got to have two, if not three labs that repeat. So that's where Phyllis Budinger came in because she identified another commercial lab. Now I'm just going to, for a sidebar, I actually tried to get a university lab first. I talked to Texas Tech, to University of Texas, to Rice University, and University of Houston. All of those uh, universities, once they know the history of how this sample supposedly came to be, they're like verbatim. Um, they don't want to test it. So I could not get a university to test this sample. So we had to go to another commercial lab. So we went to another commercial lab. And if you look, we'll have image number four up on the screen. So if you look on image number four, this shows you basically the results on magnesium isotopes with the new lab, the new lab which was in Cleveland, Ohio, and this was by Dr. Arthur Varnes. He was a chemist who worked uh, in the oil industry 
and had a lot of familiarity with ICPMS. So if you look where all these samples fell, right? And so if you look on that line, you see on the far right, North Atlantic, well, that, that's basically magnesium samples that came out of the North Atlantic Ocean, and that shows you where its ratio falls. Go way to the left, and you see meteorite, right? Well, that's <clears throat> not because meteorites are 100% magnesium, but that's because some meteorites have a very small amount of magnesium in them, and you can see how they fall way to the left on this. And just to the right of the meteorite is the Ubatuba sample that was tested in Cleveland. And you can see to the right of there, the Ubatuba sample that Dr. Peter Sturick tested. And you know, various other ones uh, from the Amazon River, the Dow, this Dow triply sublimed, that was one that was super pure magnesium that Dow Chemical created. That's where it falls in the line, falls very close to the nominal. But you can see way at the bottom is the Ubatuba sample that we originally tested in Austin. So based on what we're seeing here, the isotope ratios of the magnesium in this sample are terrestrial. Uh, the, the problem as to why the Austin lab is so far off, we don't know the answer to. Um, but this is a good example of why it's very important to use more than one lab when you do analysis. You can't just do one lab and, and stop. All right, so now, even though, you know, that didn't turn out well, uh, we looked at the ratios of the other elements, right? The isotope ratios, because you could have a particular element that might have the same isotope ratio on the moon as it does on Earth, but most of the other elements may not. So it's still worthwhile to look at. If you look at image number four, uh, excuse me, um, that would be image number, let's see, it's the image that has all of the strontium, copper, zinc, and barium on it. And that should be image number five. Okay, if I won't go into this in detail, but if you look at it, you'll see that the various ratios, we've got elements where the ratios don't meet nominal terrestrial abundance. Uh, for example, look at the copper, which is the darker horizontal line. Uh, in Austin, the, in that lab, copper 63, copper 65, the first one is higher than nominal. The second one is lower than nominal. And if you look at the Cleveland results, copper 63 looks about right and copper 65 looks about right. But then jump up to the, uh, let's see, let's go to the zinc values. Zinc 64, which should be 48.6, is 46.99 on the Cleveland sample and 49.41 on the Austin sample. So we've got some major discrepancies between the two labs. So that sent up a red flag. Um, so, so let's jump now to, okay, so what, what can we, can, you know, what do we think, why did this happen? What do we think happened? I think we could say that with magnesium, we know that that does definitely appear to be terrestrial isotope ratios. We don't know for certain on the trace metals. And if I were to go back and do it again, here's what I would do different. I would have tried to find first labs that were unique for those elements. In other words, they had experience looking into isotopes for these elements. Although both labs that we used had experience with this high technology equipment and had had experience with various isotope ratios, they were not experienced on those particular elements. So I think going back, we would have had them uh, basically isolate the zinc and isolate the barium and isolate the strontium, right? Because you've got a sample here that's like 99% magnesium and very small amounts of trace elements. So we really should have isolated those trace elements separately and then gone and done the high, 
the high resolution ICPMS testing. Um, so could we conclude that, you know, this material is extraterrestrial? I really can't say one way or the other. Uh, and I, I hate to say that, but the, there's still a question on the, on the ratios of the trace elements. My gut feel would be that if, if we redid them with um, basically separating each element out by itself, then doing high-res ICPMS, that they would probably fall in line, but I can't know that for sure. But there's, there's one unanswered part, and, and that is the magnesium purity. Uh, we still don't have a good explanation for why we have 99.88% pure magnesium that shows up in Ubatupa, Brazil in 1957. There's no reasonable explanation for that. Uh, that's before satellites existed, so there's no reason that would have been in any way a satellite that he saw. Uh, aircraft do not use pure magnesium. Um, nor do meteor, meteorites have pure magnesium. So we're still at a loss to just explain the purity of the magnesium. So that's kind of a summary. Uh, like I said, there's a lot more detail to this that I didn't go through, but um, we'll jump now to questions and I'll let Alejandro uh, pull up some of the questions from the uh, chat room. All right, let's see here. The first question would be, well, there are actually two questions that were related, so I'll let you answer them both. Both, Of course, uh, Jacques Vallée is known to have looked into this material. Uh, can you speak to that if you're familiar with his work or if some of this is similar? And also, if these measurements matched up to Vallée's work? Um, <clears throat> I know that Jacques Vallée has looked into it. I believe his sample came from Peter Sturrock, which is where our samples came. Uh, what I do not know is the type of equipment he used to analyze it. And I have not seen the detailed results. I saw a summary that I believe he uh, presented. Uh, it's online, but the, uh, the values I think were uh, rounded either to the nearest 10th or to the nearest whole number. Uh, so I, I really can't comment too much because I haven't seen a detailed report from Jacques on that. All right, another question is, um, who owned the materials during the 50s and the 60s? Okay, so during uh, the 1950s, uh, in 57, it was owned by uh, Dr. Fontes, who the Brazilian newspaper turned it over to him. In 1958, uh, if I pronounce her name right, he turned it over to the head of APRO, her name I believe is Coral Lorenzen, and she had possession of it for uh, much of the late, for the rest of the time into the late 1960s. Now I'm not certain the exact year that she turned it over to Dr. Peter Sturick, but I believe she was in possession of it when Oak Ridge National Laboratories tested it, some of the Air Force labs. Uh, there were originally uh, three samples and I, I believe the Air Force destroyed much of the first sample when they did their testing. Um, and it's, it's difficult at this point in time to know of the samples that we currently have, did they come from sample one, two, or three, uh, you know, that were originally found. <coughs> All right, I wanted to mention this comment, uh, it's from uh, Dr. Kevin Knuth, that's just a funny comment. I would worry about flying anything made of magnesium at high speed through an oxygen rich atmosphere. No one wants to fly in a sparkler. Oh yeah, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. I mean, magnesium, once it ignites, it's like a gigantic, your, your aircraft would turn into a gigantic flare uh, and it reach temperatures somewhere up around 3000 centigrade, if I recall correctly unless it was 3000 Fahrenheit, but either way, it's extremely hot and magnesium burns uh, very hot. So yeah, I can't imagine any craft made out of magnesium that's going to fly through the atmosphere at high speed. 
Martin, and I should mention Martin of Podcast UFO is in the background helping us there. Uh, you might have heard him a little while ago during the presentation for a second, but uh, he said, yeah, he watched magnesium burn in science class. But uh, another question would be, I know this is a different sample than what this person is referring to, but maybe you can speak to any similarities. Is this the same as a magnesium bismuth zinc sample that we hear so much about? No. Um, <clears throat> and you know, I'm trying to remember, maybe it was magnesium. I know the bismuth sample that uh, I believe to the stars is analyzing. And they're actually, um, I met with Hal uh, put off and introduced him to the lab manager in Austin. Um, so he would, he may have taken it there for analysis. I don't know. Um, and, and Hal's a pretty sharp guy. So I would think that he would um, have a second lab measure, you know, that sample. The, uh, What's interesting about that sample is that it's more than just the chemicals. It's the uh, supposedly it's interlaced with business magnesium, bismuth magnesium uh, at the nano uh, level. You know, I don't know if it's like one micron or half a micron of thickness. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested to see what they come back with once they uh, test that sample. But that sample in addition to looking at isotope uh, ratios, you could also do a TEM. And uh, the Austin lab is very good at that, uh, where they would uh, slice through the sample and look at exactly what the thicknesses of the bismuth and magnesium as, you, uh, as it alternates through the, the sample. All right, another question here, and you kind of spoke to the ownership a little earlier, but someone would kind of like you to address specifically the uh, issue of uh, chain of custody. Okay, so <clears throat> normally, you know, um, on, on chain of custody, I guess I have mixed feelings on that. It's kind of a, a, a legal term that police departments use and it's not like there's a document you sign off, right? But in this case, there's the, what you call, quote, the chain of custody, very bad. Um, here's all we know for sure. We know that the sample showed up in 1957 in Brazil, right? We do not know the name of the person who provided the sample. Um, so that, that's the only thing we really uh, know. Now we do know because the sample was tested in 57, it was tested again in 19, excuse me, it's tested 57 and 58 at Oak Ridge and 61 at Dow Chemical. And the, the high magnesium purity, that, that's been a constant throughout. So, uh, the, you know, someone could always say, oh, well, maybe somehow in 1960, sometime after 61, someone inserted a different sample, but I don't think that's very likely. Um, so I'm confident that the sample we're testing is the same sample as was first tested by Oak Ridge National Laboratories and Dow Chemical back in 1958 and 1961. That I, I feel pretty confident. Um, I, I think to me, the bigger concern is the contamination that the sample potentially undergoes right? Because you have uncontrolled handling. In chemistry, I mean, the key thing is you want, you really want to control your handling. Um, so that's why we can't do surface analysis on it, uh, because of all the handling. It's, I don't even think it's worth trying. That's why we look basically at bulk analysis of the material in the center. All right. Another question kind of along those lines is, uh, has the provenance of the piece been solidified from 1957 forward? Um, I'm not sure the difference in that question from the one I just answered. Um, yeah, not really. I think you've pretty much um, concluded or answered that one, but let's move to the next one. Uh, can you conclude confidently that this is manufactured and not natural? Oh, can I conclude confidently that it's, man oh yeah, yeah. It's, I mean, you don't find 99.88% magnesium in nature. 
right? I mean, it had to be manufactured. The question is just, was it manufactured by someone here on earth, right? Or was it manufactured somewhere else? I mean, it's definitely manufactured. There's no uh, doubt about that. All right, the next question, um, let's see here. Is the variance between labs typical for isotopic analysis for other elements? Um, the, <clears throat> the labs that, that I used, uh, it's basically, they have equipment that's capable of isotopic analysis, but they, the chemists that did the work, I don't think are necessarily uh, well trained in the isotopic analysis techniques of, of really any elements. Most of their work is looking at, okay, is this 99.98% magnesium? Is this 99.97? I know the Austin lab looks at the isotopes of boron because boron's used in doping uh, silicon chips. But I don't think that any of them are uh, experts in it. Now, I will say this, and I didn't mention it in my talk. Both labs use NIST traceable uh, samples in order to calibrate their equipment before they measured these samples. So they had magnesium, strontium, barium um, standards from NIST that they calibrated the equipment against. I think where the technique differs, and this is my opinion, is that when, when you're looking at a sample that's so pure in magnesium and you're trying to analyze a uh, trace elements, your equipment can be swamped by the magnesium signal. So that's why I think it would have been important to pull the trace elements out of it because this equipment is so delicate that you don't want to swap, you don't want signals to get swamped in any way, especially when you're measuring trace elements through in 10 to 100 parts per million. And, and by the way, the 10 to 100 parts per million, that is of the entire element. And then your, of course, your uh, isotopes are even a smaller percentage, right? They're two or three or 4% of that amount. All right, the next question, there's a couple of here that are similar. So um, the question is, what are the elements normally found with magnesium on earth? And kind of a part two to that would be a second question. Are the trace elements like those normally found with magnesium on Earth? Okay, um, I'll start with the latter question. Uh, that's no, those trace elements are not normally found uh, with magnesium on Earth. Uh, and what's probably the most unusual is just the purity of the magnesium. In terms of uh, you know where magnesium is found and what elements are usually with it, I mean, I'm not a, um, a geologist and I don't specialize in that, but I do know that magnesium normally is found, I think it's called dolomite. It's got a lot of calcium in it. Um, it's uh, a mixture it, it, and if it's got calcium, it probably or also has other elements in that part of the periodic table. Uh, but it's, it's not strontium and barium that's found um, with magnesium. As a matter of fact, let's say I'm just going back, the strontium impurity, the first time that had been looked at uh, in small quantities, trace impurities, because in fireworks, you can add a lot of strontium to get like red color. But in terms of trace impurities in high purity magnesium, uh, Dow Chemical had done some lab work on that to see how that affected the uh, magnesium. All right, more questions here. The next one would be, I guess he's asking, does this rule out uh, that this material, and I think he spoke to this already, is uh, 
extraterrestrial or of origin? Okay, so uh, the bottom line question there. Um, I mean, I see everything shades of gray. So I, I don't think that I can answer that question absolutely in either direction. Uh, I think if you were asking me to bet, you know, thousand dollars, okay, Robert, is this ex ter terrestrial, which doesn't mean it's built by an alien necessarily, other than didn't come from this planet or not. Um, I would probably lean 90% that this is terrestrial. Uh, the, the part that actually argues the strongest for me is the purity of the magnesium. Uh, I just can't come up with a good explanation for how you would get 99.88% magnesium purity in Brazil in the year 1957. All right, next question is, okay, this is, comes from one of your colleagues, Peter, from the SEU. Isn't the most logical explanation that this is just a terrestrial sample and the whole thing is a hoax as the original person disappeared? Right, right. And, and you know, that's one of the first things you would think, okay, this guy disappeared. And we do know from his handwriting that he was uh, an, quite edu well educated, right? So did some uh, <clears throat> chemist, right, in 1957 Brazil <clears throat> decide to play a, a hoax on that, right? So the, if he did, the question becomes, well, where did he get the magnesium? Uh, because the magnesium, to my knowledge, of that purity didn't exist anywhere outside of some major laboratories and to my knowledge, nowhere did it exist other than at Dow Chemical with trace elements of strontium. So you have to say, okay, well, I mean, this guy knows somebody at Dow Chemical and take a sample from there and bring it down and make a claim that that's what it was. And additionally, to do it, he burned the magnesium and put it out because he clearly didn't uh, just bring a sample right? Because the Oak Ridge National Laboratory has already determined that the sample had been heated to extreme temperatures, which is, you know, matches burning up in the atmosphere. So I don't think, you know, the hoax questions, the first one I always thought of too, uh, I just can't make the uh, pieces of the puzzle fit with the hoax uh, for that, you know, year in time. I mean, if someone could, could come up and tell me, oh, Robert, okay, here's where he could have gotten it. And we found out that the University of Brazil, for example, uh, was working with uh, a purity of magnesium beyond what anyone else in the Western world was working with at that period of time. Well, so, well, maybe you've got an argument, uh, but I just can't come up with a, a good plausible explanation. Uh, another viewer wants to ask if you've heard of the Council Bluffs 1977 material. No, I have not heard of that. So I'm not familiar with that material. <clears throat> okay, so here's a longer question. Were the ICPMS samples taken from the same area of the object? Perhaps it could be location slash layering effect. Uh, that's, <clears throat> that's a possibility. Right. And if we had only done one or two tests, you know, in one or two labs, then I would agree with that. But the types of tests that have been done to the sample um, over the years, you know, from 1958 onwards to here, all indicate a very high purity of magnesium. That's the one constant uh, across all labs. And <clears throat> the ability to test for high purity magnesium. Although in 1957 you know, Brazil, Dr. Fontes, uh, his equipment basically just said it was 100%. So for all practical purposes, that just tells you between 99 and 100. Um, Oak Ridge Lab identified it the next year is around 99.9 .9, and so did Dow Chemical Lab. And 
uh, upgrade huge spectrometer, um, Dow Chemical. I'd have to look up the type of equipment that they used. Um, I think it was neutron activation. Uh, so, so there were different methods that were used. So, but, so back to the question of could we have, uh, you know, could it be at the area inside? Well, <clears throat> there were three different samples and all the tests have always come back the same way. So in terms of magnesium purity. So I, I'm just not sure how um, that, you know, that would come into play. But it's, it's definitely something, you know, that I'm sure the chemists, as they did their testing, considered. All right, from the same person, uh, G. Vasquez, uh, he's asking, can exposure to something like a neutron source permanently change the isotopic types of these light metals? Yes, that is correct. If, if, you, um, if you expose the metal to a, a neutron source, you will change the ratios of magnesium 24, 25, 26. Additionally, if a, uh, theoretically, if something burns up in the atmosphere, you may have a change in your ratios also, right? Because your magnesium 24 is slightly lighter than magnesium 26. So that could shift it. So there are a number of ways where your magnesium ratios could shift, but all the testing we've done tends to indicate the magnesium uh, ratios of its isotopes appear to be normal as far as you know we can tell. Uh, and you know, on confidence wise, I, I feel, I know I'm probably 99% confident that the magnesium ratios are, are terrestrial. Now that doesn't mean the sample's terrestrial uh, because certain elements, depending on, you know, where they are uh, created could match an earth isotope ratio. Uh, I know with the moon, some of them match with the earth and others don't, right? Um, so that's, that's kind of my comment on the, the magnesium. Yes, new, uh, neutron bombardment will change the ratio. Good question. All right, I'm gonna ask a question from Jim. He's been asking it over and over. He's very adamant to get his answer. He's asking, uh, so he has uh, interpreted what you're saying is that since 1950, the materials have changed. <clears throat> Maybe he can ask that differently. I'm not, I'm not My sure guess he... is he might mean that because the tests have results have been different. Oh, no, the, the difference in the testing results, in my opinion, are basically due to the labs, not, not the material itself. Now, okay, and, and I'll say, I say that with a, a caveat. You know, clearly, if, you know, if this is just your material, right, and I test over on this side of the sample or into this part of this part, there could be variation within the sample itself. I, I agree, that is correct. Um, but the testing variation on the magnesium percentage, um, basically you just see, I mean, it all makes sense to me, right? In 1957 in Brazil, all they can say is it's pure magnesium. They can't test that. And then from then on, all the magnesium in terms of the percent of magnesium stays, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of 99.8 to 99.9. Uh, your isotope, your um, uh, trace metals vary a little bit, right? And that can be because of either the equipment or the trace metals varying across the sample, right? In terms of the isotope ratios, uh, that, um, I don't, there's no reason that isotope ratios would vary uh, over time, you know, assuming, you know, someone didn't put the samples near a neutron source. Um, so I, I can't think of a, a good uh, reason why that would happen to isotope ratios. I think the isotope ratio variation is more a function of the testing equipment than anything else. All right, let's see here. Um, there are quite a few other questions. Uh, 
So here's a question. This person says they've been bothered with the samples being untested uh, since the 90s. Um, there's been a lot of people lecturing about different, you know, these materials. But why is it taken so long to test all of this stuff? Okay, so if I understand the question right, I guess there's a concern, okay, there was testing done in the 50s and 60s, a little bit in the 70s. And then there's no real testing done again until the 1990s. I believe Dr. Peter Sturrock had the sample during much of this time. And it wasn't until the 1990s that the ICPMS systems really came into play where you could begin to test isotope ratios with that type of equipment. So there was a, uh, a definite jump in our ability to measure in the 1990s. And that's when Peter Sturrock uh, did his isotope ratio testing. And then when I did it uh, another 20 years later, <clears throat> was because the equipment has reached the point now that you can test the isotope ratios of the trace metals. And uh, there's even a, a piece of equipment, it's basically ICPMS, but uh, I believe it's got four uh, heads to it and it's called like a MR, MH ICPMS or something like that. Some of the universities have it and it's even more uh, delicate as a piece of equipment. So that's why I think uh, there weren't, it doesn't bother me that there was testing done for 20 some odd years. I think you've answered this question already, but I guess just to kind of separate it out directly, someone asked, couldn't Anyone alive today replicate this sample? Yes, this sample today could could be replicated without a problem. Um, so it's, it wouldn't be an issue today to duplicate this sample. Now, I would say, if you if someone came and said, "Hey, I saw this flying in the air, it crashed, and here's my sample," uh, there would be some questions of, okay, exactly where did this sample come from? Right? I mean, it's not like you could you're going to find any material that's made today that's that's got a few hundred ppm strontium barium with a with a touch of zinc and copper and it's 99.9 you know percent magnesium uh, that's not a sample you're going to find manufactured anywhere when i say it could be replicated what i'm saying is if you told a university lab or dow chemical hey, this is what I want. I want this amount of this, this amount of this, this amount of this, they could do it. But uh, it's not something that's normally made today. Hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Um, here's a question. Have you been able to discern any reason why someone would bring together such pure magnesium, strontium, barium, zinc, and copper in this way? Um, why would someone manufacture something like this? Now, I'm not a material scientist, but I no, I have no idea why someone would add those impurities to magnesium. Uh, and like, you know, Kevin Newth mentioned earlier, um, I'm not sure what you do with that purity of magnesium. I mean, you use it in the lab to run experiments and things, but in terms of uh, making something in everyday life uh, outside of flares or a pyrotechnic, um, and then those you don't need pure that purity of magnesium uh, for either of those, flares or pyrotechnic. Uh, I just don't know what you, why you would manufacture that. I mean, it, it really does get back to Peter's question of, okay, did someone just pull some of this out of a lab and stick it on the beach? Um, you know, you're left with, okay, well, no one did that. How did it get there? And I don't have a good answer for that. I think it's an interesting mystery. Another question is, uh, magnesium ions are necessary for hundreds of biological enzymes. Its electrical properties are also used in electronics. Um, was there a nanotech structure that you've seen? <clears throat> okay, that's an interesting question. The problem is in terms of you know, was there a nanotech structure or, or some kind of underlying uh, 
we don't know because it burned up in the atmosphere. So basically your magnesium melted. And, you know, if, if there was a structure, it's gone. Uh, so there's no way for us to determine that now. So I just have to say unknown for that question. All right. Another question is who paid for the research, these tests? Okay. Well, so the, uh, the payment for the test came from donations from myself, from Dr. Uh, Michael Swords, Dr. Mark Rodiger, and from Phyllis Budinger, because these tests are not uh, cheap. You're looking at usually about $1,500 to run a, a most high-res ICPMS tests. Uh, I, I really wish we could have got a u university. I mean, I called a, uh, a professor in California who is a specialist on magnesium to see if we could get him interested. And uh, other than one email reply, I, I never could get uh, any further interest from him in it. All right, another question. Um, okay, here's a more uh, technical one. Let's see, did the material in this layering appear to be accrued from a deposit deposition process like PCD or CVD? In other words, was there a lack of variances, dislocations, and other artifacts of alloyed metals? Yeah, there's, <clears throat> this kind of goes back to the other question. There's no way to determine that because uh, the magnesium was burning in the atmosphere. So, and as Oak Ridge National Laboratories also indicated, uh, it had seen extreme heat. So when you do like chemical vapor deposition, uh, especially of a, a material like magnesium, you know, once you get it to th these high temperatures, because it burns at extreme temperatures, your, uh, your crystalline structure is gonna be destroyed. All right, uh, next question is, um, why couldn't this have been manufactured in Russia or some European lab and brought to Brazil? The Russians are fantastically good at material science. Yeah, no, that's that's possible. I mean, that, that's similar to the question, you know, the to the hoax question, right? Uh, could someone from uh, the, so at that time it was the Soviet Union, uh, I. I haven't researched it, but I would suspect that their ability to make high purity magnesium in a laboratory setting was probably comparable to ours. Um, but, you know, why they would do that, you know, is an interesting question. I mean, that's a lot of, uh, when you think about it, you're talking about a lab, somewhere a lab is making high purity magnesium, which at the time was very difficult and would be used for very specific, important tests for someone to take, I think the original samples, I'd have to look it up. I mean, you're talking about many grams of sample and just take it out of their lab, take it to Brazil and then basically burn it because it had been oxidized heavily. Uh, just stretches the imagination, right? If you've worked in a chemistry lab and if you're doing state-of-the-art work, you don't take some of your sample, burn it, and then make it look like it's a, a UFO hoax. At least that's my opinion. Um, I'll let you address this just because uh, Jack Safardi, who we're uh, aware of, you know, a scientist who has worked in this field, um, his he's I guess this is more of a comment that he's making and it'd be interesting to hear your point of view. Um, he feels as though this material could come from the future. Okay, that's, that's a, uh, you know, a valid uh, possibility, right? I mean, by valid, I mean, it's a hypothesis that can be entertained. Um, just like you would entertain the hypothesis of did it, you know, come from another uh, civilization or another world. Um, if, you know, if it came from the future, then it's, uh, you know, it will be the same as terrestrial isotope ratios. It should be at least, unless for some reason somebody decided to change 
in the in the manufacturing decide to change the isotope ratios. Um, the question, of course, goes back to. So, what? I mean, it's as far as a hypothesis, it's just as valid as the it came from another world hypothesis. Other than, of course, all the arguments about well, if you meet your grandfather and all that kind of stuff, uh, how do you have time travel? But uh, just the abstract thought could it be something that we produce in the future? That, you know, I guess the answer could be possibly. Uh, here's a question, and there are actually a couple questions along these lines, kind of talking about cooperation. So somebody asked, what's keeping the SCU, people like Valet and Bigelow, et cetera, from joining collective efforts and presenting their find findings in a peer review uh, public consumption? Uh, another question along these lines are, you know, why aren't you working with like uh, Hal Putoff? Um, Maybe you can answer that as far as, you know, the collaborations going on. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Hal, I know very well. Hal lives in Austin. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, um, I introduced Hal to the, uh, the current manager of the Austin Cerium Lab. So to that extent, there, has, there is cooperation. Uh, and, you know, he, he knows that I'm, you know, that we're not just me, but SEU as a whole is willing to help whenever possible. Uh, so I, I have no, no problem working with Hal, uh, and I'm sure he has no problem working with me. It, in terms of, you know, doing some joint statement, uh, the SCU has actually uh, brought that up to TTSA in various uh, formats. I've mentioned it to Hal. I think others have mentioned it to Louis Elizondo. I think both those guys are... Uh, consider that a good idea, but it never has gotten off the ground yet. And that's not because of SCU. So there's some, some kink in the road somewhere along there that's keeping uh, that from happening. But I think ideally, if I could just wave a magic wand, uh, TTSA is a very good marketing organization. I don't always agree with how they market everything, but they're a very good marketing organization. I think SCU is much better in terms of uh, an investigative group and an analysis group. So I think it would make sense to merge our abilities. Uh, you know, if, if we could come to a common agreement on how that would be done and a way that uh, it still meets our goals as an organization. And, and of course, I'm sure TTSA would look the same way from their, their viewpoint. All right, just so we'll ask a couple more questions if that's all right. Okay. Uh, let's see. I understand you kind of answered this one al already, but I understand non-terrestrial isotopes are impossible to manufacture. Do any samples have these isotopes? Valet claimed some did. Okay, no, it's not. Imp uh, well, let me ask me the second part again in a minute, but on the first part, it's not like you can't manufacture, quote, extraterrestrial isotopes. I mean, all that is, is it's a fingerprint of the elements. I mean, just like that, that's some of the research they do on the moon, right? If there's a theory that at one time the moon was ripped out of the earth. Well, if that's the case, your isotope ratios should be very similar on all your elements, unless you have a reason why one element would not have the same isotope ratios between the earth and the moon. So that's one way to try to prove that theory. So just because I just want to say it's it's a fingerprint. It's not like there's something magical about the isotope ratios, and you know this one's extraterrestrial and this one's Earth-based. Um, and what, what was the second part of the question, Alejandro? Let's see. The second part is. It was a good question. I, I just don't recall it. Oh, just uh, the full question was, I understand non-terrestrial isotopes are impossible to manufacture. Do any samples have these isotopes? Valet claimed some did. I guess the, the question is saying that Valet claims some samples have extraterrestrial isotopes, 
Right. Okay. So like on the data I presented, right? Some of the data indicated that the isotopes were extraterrestrial. But when I had them tested again at a second lab, we got conflicting results. So the question then becomes, okay, it, is it really because these are extraterrestrial isotopes or is this because of the testing procedure or something else? So um, I, I think the question is, does uh, ballet have chemical data that indicates his samples extraterrestrial? Now, I believe he's got the same, a similar sample uh, from Dr. Sturick that we used in our analysis. So uh, he should do the same as we did, which would be he needs to get multiple labs to test that sample. Uh, same thing for how in his bismuth magnesium sample. And, and you can see how long it took me. And I don't know if people who've worked with me, I, I go pretty quick. I don't, you know, slow down. And it, it took a total of a year and a half to get this done between two different labs. And, and that's mostly because, you know, delays at the lab end, you know, uh, with the labs rather than delays with us. All right. Uh, this question, does molten magnesium on cooling give pure material? Uh, yes, it, it can. That's what, uh, that's how Dow Chemical in 1957 created their very pure sample, which was as pure as this sample. Uh, they did it uh, basically by subliming the magnesium, which is basically melting it and, and resubliming it. And then they did that, I believe, two to three times in order to purify the magnesium. So yes, you can purify it by that method. All right, another question is, was there any trace of strontium-90 as a possible indicator to radio track, uh, radioactive neutron source? since this was the era of testing nuclear nuclear energy? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, strontium-90 was not picked up in the, uh, in the sample. Um, that is a radioactive isotope, so its percentage is going to change over time. But no, we did not pick up any strontium-90. All right, the next question is, um, what would be the cost to manufacture something like this? But I guess that would be more important. What would be the cost back in the 50s? Oh, if somebody wanted to just make this today, or uh, I mean, to make it in 1957, you know, in 50 in dollar in today's dollars, I'm sure is extreme because you're making something that is made in very few labs in the world. Um, today, I don't, I mean, that's hard to say what would it cost. I don't know. Maybe if, you know, it, it really depends. Uh, maybe $10,000, maybe it might cost $100,000. It depends on if you've got a, a laboratory that's set up to do this. If you don't, then you have to do all of these preliminary tests to get your lab to a point where it can do this type of work. So it's not like you just flip a switch. Now, if you've already got the you've already flipped a switch and you got this type of process going, then it doesn't cost as much. So that's kind of manufacturing 101 there. All right, and uh, this will be our last questions. Uh, what is the next step in the analysis? Um, I'm at a point, I talked to Mike Swords about this, if we could get a university, and I've tried as much as I can to get a university uh, to analyze these, and um, I think that would be the next step to try to get them to do the <clears throat> trace elements. And if I was going to do that, I would uh, basic, and there's chemical ways you can do this, but I would extract the strontium, the uh, uh, bar was it barium? Yeah, the strontium, the barium, copper, and the zinc, and have each one analyzed separately, and ideally by someone who was who had experience on those particular elements and their isotopes. Uh, that would be the best way to do it. And I guess we'll add one more question. One more was slid in there. Uh, do we have plans to uh, 
do any analysis on other samples? Uh, I don't have any samples, you know, that we could analyze. Uh, if someone had a sample, right, and, and the first thing we have to do is make a determination that there's a reason to analyze that sample, right, that it, uh, it's not just something someone found somewhere, right? There's got to be some background to it because you're talking about a lot of man hours. I probably put in 100 to 200 man hours doing this. And I know Mike did. Uh, and of course, the labs did. And then the cost. So if someone has a sample that's got a good history, um, we definitely could do it. I mean, I, I stay in contact with the Austin lab all the time. So it, it doesn't take long to get it, get the wheels going. Um, we just have to know it makes sense to do it. And th this one made sense because it's been tested a dozen times. Um, there was much more history to it. Um, I mean, I've looked at other samples. I've looked at um, the data that someone had on su supposed crash site in New Mexico. It wasn't Roswell, it was a different one. And you could tell looking at the data there was it was terrestrial. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't mixed like this. I thought it was pretty clear cut. That's the answer to that question. I, pr I appreciate all the good questions everyone's asked. Yeah, some great questions. And I think, you know, I and, and the rest of the audience have appreciated uh, your presentation. Uh, one comment from Andrea of the UFO Museum in Victoria Entre Rios in Argentina. I guess they have ballet samples there and they're looking to collect some more. So if anybody's in Argentina, you could get a first hand look at that. But uh, Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Hope everyone else did. All right, everybody, you could go to explorescu.org to get more information about the Scientific Coalition for UAP Research. Of course, uh, like Robert said, this uh, stuff is expensive, so feel free to go there to donate or to also look at a lot of great videos. Uh, we talked about how put off and uh, some of the guys to the stars like Luis Elizondo they were actually at the conference that we held last year. Luis did a presentation that you can see on the website. Uh, and we have more exciting stuff, including some great papers there as well. So thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, keep an eye on the website and our social media for more of these presentations. We will have another one that we will uh, let you give you a heads up on when that will be coming out in the next few weeks here. So thank you very much. And we'll see you next time.